Hi, I'm Chris Rycroft, and welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. In this video, we're going to look at discretizations for parabolic partial differential equations, and we're going to look at their accuracy and stability properties. The canonical parabolic equation is the heat equation, where for a function u of t and x, it must satisfy ut minus alpha uxx is equal to f of t and x. And here, alpha is a constant that models the thermal diffusivity. And in this section, we'll omit alpha for convenience. And this can be done because we can always rescale our time variable in order to absorb this constant. So typically, we solve the heat equation as an initial boundary value problem. So we impose an initial condition, so u at t equals 0 and x is equal to u subscript 0 of x. And we can impose boundary conditions on both sides of our domain. So a natural idea for numerically solving the heat equation will be to discretize the uxx term using a central difference method and then employ the forward Euler method in time. And that would give us the numerical scheme un plus 1j minus unj divided by delta t minus unj minus 1 minus 2unj plus unj plus 1 divided by delta x squared is equal to 0. And here we have omitted the right-hand side function f of t and x. Alternatively, we could use a backward Euler method in time, and then we would end up with the same scheme, but now the terms in our spatial discretization would be at time n plus 1 instead of at time n. And this would now give us an implicit numerical scheme. Another option would be to do something halfway in between, where we take half of the explicit stencil at time n and half of the implicit stencil at time n plus 1 for our spatial derivative. And this is called the Crank-Nicholson method and dates from a paper that was published in 1947. So it's actually common to consider a one-parameter family of methods that include all of the above and we'll refer to this as the theta method. And here, we'll take theta copies of the stencil at time n plus 1, and 1 minus theta copies of it at time n. And here then, theta will be between 0 and 1. And we can see then that if theta is equal to 0, then we'll have our explicit method. If theta is equal to a half, we'll have our Crank-Nicholson method. And if theta is equal to 1, then we will have our implicit method. So we'll now analyze our theta method. And we'll perform a Fourier stability analysis. And then we will analyze its truncation error. Let's now look at performing a stability analysis for the theta method for the heat equation. And here, our discretization has the form un plus 1j minus unj divided by delta t. And we then have two terms that involve center difference formulae for our second order spatial derivative. We have theta times a formula evaluated at time step n plus 1, and 1 minus theta times a formula evaluated at time step n. And to perform Fourier stability analysis, we'll try an ansatz that's equal to unj is equal to lambda of k to the n times e to the i j k delta x. And here k is a wave number associated with this particular Fourier wave. And lambda of k gives us our amplification factor. And for a stable numerical method, we want that all of the lambda have magnitude less than or equal to 1. So we'll now go ahead and substitute this form into our discretization. And we can see that we'll immediately get a common factor between all terms of lambda to the n e to the i j k delta x. So if we look at this first term here, when we look at u n plus 1 j, we'll have a factor of lambda to the n plus 1. But we can cancel away a common factor of lambda to the n. So we'll therefore get a term that's just lambda. 
And for this term, we'll get a term that's just 1, and that will be divided by delta t. Now let's look at this term. We have a common factor of lambda to the n plus 1 in all these terms, and we can pull out the factor of lambda to the n, so that will just give us a single lambda in front of this. And when we look at the j minus 1 term, then we'll have e to the i j minus 1 k delta x, and we have that common factor of e to the i j k delta x, so that will leave us with a term of e to the minus i k delta x. From this term, we'll just have minus 2, and from this term, we'll get a exponential e to the i k delta x. And we'll get similar terms here. We'll get a e to the minus i k delta x from this term, minus 2 plus e to the i k delta x. So now let's do some simplifications. We have this constant mu, which is equal to delta t divided by delta x squared. So if we multiply through by delta t, we can convert these into mu's. And we also know that e to the minus i k delta x plus e to the i k delta x is equal to 2 cosine k delta x. So we therefore get that this can be lambda minus 1 minus mu theta lambda 2 cosine k delta x minus 2 minus 1 minus theta mu 2 cosine k delta x minus 2 is equal to 0. And we can now make use of a trig identity. We know that 1 minus cosine k delta x is equal to 2 sine squared k delta x divided by 2. And therefore we can convert these two bracketed expressions into minus 4 sine squared k delta x divided by 2. And so therefore we'll get lambda minus 1 plus 4 mu theta lambda sine squared k delta x over 2 plus 1 minus theta for mu sine squared k delta x divided by 2 is equal to 0. And now let's collect all of the terms involving lambda on the left hand side and all of the terms that don't involve lambda on the right hand side and we'll have lambda times 1 plus 4 mu theta sine squared k delta x divided by 2 is equal to 1 minus 4 mu 1 minus theta sine squared k delta x divided by 2. And we therefore find that lambda of k is equal to 1 minus 4 mu 1 minus theta sine squared k delta x over 2 divided by 1 plus 4 mu theta sine squared k delta x over 2. Let's now look at our expression for lambda of k. And to show that our method is stable, we need to show that the magnitude of lambda is less than or equal to 1 for all values of k. And if we look at our expression for lambda, we see that in this case, lambda always works out to be a real number, since all of the terms here are real numbers themselves. So the only way that this method could be unstable is if lambda is greater than 1, or lambda is less than minus 1. Let's first look at the case where lambda is greater than 1. Here, lambda is written as 1 minus something divided by 1 plus something. And there's no way that this expression could be greater than 1. So we can't have lambda greater than 1.
However, we could have lambda less than minus 1. So in that case, then, we'll check for stability when lambda is greater than or equal to minus 1. And in that case, we'll have that 1 minus 4 mu times 1 minus theta sine squared k delta x over 2 is greater than or equal to minus 1 plus 4 theta mu sine squared k delta x divided by 2. And we can rearrange this to obtain that 4 mu 1 minus 2 theta sine squared k delta x divided by 2 is less than or equal to 2. So let's look at this expression. We know that mu is positive. We know that sine squared is positive and bounded by 1. And so the only way that this inequality can be violated is if 1 minus 2 theta is positive as well. And therefore, we see that if theta is in the range from half to 1, then our method is unconditionally stable. Because in this case, the left-hand side of this inequality will be negative, and therefore this inequality will always be true. If we look at the case where theta is between 0 and a half, then the method could be unstable. And the most unstable Fourier mode would correspond to when sine squared k delta x over 2 is maximized. So if k is equal to pi divided by delta x, then that would imply that sine squared k delta x divided by 2 is equal to 1. So we can plot what this mode would look like. And in this case, this mode has a wavelength of two grid points, and so this mode will look like the following. And this mode is often referred to as a sawtooth mode because of its shape, and we can see why this would be problematic for our scheme. Suppose we look at evaluating a second derivative at a particular grid point, then that will involve taking a finite difference stencil involving three grid points that form a V, and that will give us a very large calculation for our second derivative. And there is a possibility that that evaluation will cause our numerical method to overshoot and our solution may increase in time. And when we show a numerical example, we'll see exactly how this manifests itself. So how can we avoid this situation? So if the other terms here satisfy that 4 mu times 1 minus 2 theta is less than or equal to 2, then we will have a stable scheme.
and therefore we would require that mu would be less than or equal to 1 divided by 2, 1 minus 2 theta. And if we look in the plane of theta and mu, then we know that our solution will always be stable if theta is bigger than a half, and as theta approaches a half, the permissible values to get a stable scheme will increase. So we can draw a region of the plane that looks like this, and this region will give us stability. So this is a case where we have conditional stability. And specifically, we will require that delta t has to be less than or equal to delta x squared divided by 2 times 1 minus 2 theta. And it's worth comparing this to the time step restriction that emerges with the linear advection equation. There we found that delta t had to be less than or equal to delta x divided by c. So we see that for our heat equation and for this scheme, our time step has to scale like our grid spacing squared. And this will create a very stringent restriction on the values of delta t that we can use. And this scaling that we have to satisfy here is more severe than what is required for linear advection. Let's now look at calculating the truncation error for the theta method. And we obtain this by substituting our mathematical solution into our discretization formula. So here I've written down the truncation error at time point Tn and grid point Xj. And all of these little u's of n and j are shorthand for our exact solution u evaluated at Tn and Xj. And if we perform this calculation, we tailor expand all of these terms, then we obtain the following expression for the truncation error. So there are a number of terms to look at here, but let's first look at the leading order term, and we have ut minus uxx, and we know that that will be zero since u satisfies the heat equation. So after this, the next largest term in order is this term, a half minus theta times delta t times u xxt. And that will be non-zero usually, but it will be zero for the case when theta is equal to a half. And therefore, we see that our method will be first order accurate in general, but it will be second order accurate for this special case when theta is equal to a half and that is precisely the Crank-Nicholson method. It's worth noting that while the overall convergence of the method is important, the exact form of the truncation error can also tell us more about the convergence results that we might expect. And as an example, let's look now at the theta method for the case when theta is between a zero and a half. And here, the truncation error will scale like big O of delta t plus delta x squared. And here, in this range, we would say that this is first order accurate overall. But we know that for theta in this range, we have a time step restriction. And we would require that our delta t 
is less than or equal to delta x squared divided by 2 times 1 minus 2 theta. Hence, if we were to perform grid refinement, then if we were taking our time step delta t to 0, then we must take delta t proportional to delta x squared, or potentially faster, in order to ensure that our time step restriction is satisfied. And if we chose this particular proportionality, then we would see that our truncation error would be big O of delta x squared plus delta x squared, and that would just be big O of delta x squared. So with this particular refinement strategy, we would see second order accuracy in our grid spacing. So this just highlights that there are some subtleties in the way that the errors might scale. Let's now take a look at the program heat.py that can solve the heat equation ut equal uxx on the periodic interval from 0 to 1. And we're going to make use of an initial condition that is a step function so that u of x at time 0 is equal to 1 if x is between a quarter and 3 quarters and 0 otherwise. And we're going to solve this equation using the theta method when theta is equal to 0 and that will give us our explicit scheme. And in the program, we first define that we'll use m equals 64 grid points. We'll create two arrays, a and b, for representing our solution. And we're going to create 40 snapshots of our solution and perform 50 time step iterations between each snapshot. We'll create an array z for storing the snapshots. We'll now define some PDE-related constants. And we'll define our grid spacing dx to be 1 divided by m and we'll choose a time step dt to be 0.2 times dx squared. And that will give our dimensionless constant mu that's equal to dt divided by dx squared that features in our numerical update formula. And as we showed in our stability analysis, for the explicit scheme, we require that mu is less than or equal to a half for stability. And here, mu will be equal to 0.2, and therefore we should have stable results. We'll now define our initial condition to be our step function, and we'll store our initial condition in the z array. We'll now integrate the PDE. We'll loop over the snapshots we want to store, perform the iterations, and we'll then loop over the spatial grid. And at every spatial grid point in our numerical update formula, we need to obtain the indices of the points to the left and right, and we'll create those in JL and JR, and we'll take into account the periodicity of the grid when we do these calculations. We'll then store our updated solution in the array B, and after we're done, we'll copy the contents of B into our array A. We'll then store snapshots of our solution and then output the results. So let me now go ahead and run this program. And by default, this program outputs the results to the terminal. So I'm going to run this program again and save them into a temporary file called out that I can then plot within GNU plot. So let me now plot the results in GNU plot. And I'm first going to plot the initial condition. And here we have our step function initial condition. And let's now plot all of the snapshots of our numerical solution. And as we see here, as time progresses, that initial discontinuity in our solution is blurred out and becomes smoother. And over time, due to the diffusion happening, our solution tends toward the constant function of u of x is equal to a half. We also see that the results here are nice and smooth and it's indicative that our numerical method is stable. So now let's rerun our program and, and change our value of dt here to be 0.4 nine nine times dx squared. So this means that our value of mu is stable 
but just at the point before the instability will happen when mu exceeds a half. So let's now run our program again. And we'll look at the new results. So again, we see that over time, our numerical solution tends toward the constant value of u equal a half. But we do see that during the numerical solution, our snapshots of our solution have evidence of this sawtooth mode, the two grid point oscillation. And in our step function initial condition, that initial condition will have some component of this sawtooth mode. And that sawtooth mode will then decay over time. And we do see that we are in a range where the sawtooth mode is decaying over time, but only very slowly. And that is indicative of the fact that we are close to this stability limit. So let's now modify our program and change 0.499 into 0 0.5001. So now we've exceeded our stability limit and we should now expect unstable results. So let's now run our program again. And let's look at the new solution snapshots. So we see now that there is a qualitative difference in the results. That sawtooth mode is no longer decaying away to zero. And even on the 40th snapshot of our solution, we see that that sawtooth mode is present and growing very, very slightly. And if we were to simulate for longer, then that sawtooth mode would eventually dominate and that will be indicative of a unstable solution method. We see here that we're only just slightly beyond that point of stability. And let's now try running this with dt equal 0 0.501. And in this case, our instability should be much larger. So if we run this program again and now look at the results, then we see that in this case that growing sawtooth mode has completely overwhelmed our numerical solution. And we're now well into a range where our numerical method is unstable. And it's worth noting here that even though we're only slightly beyond this point of stability, we're in a regime where our numerical method is now not going to give us reliable results at all. In practice, we might aim for our mu parameter to be well below a half, so that we're well into the regime where we should expect stable results. We'll now look at a second example, c-n.py, that demonstrates the Crank-Nicholson method. And as described, this is a special case of the theta method when theta is equal to a half. And the Crank-Nicholson method is second order accurate overall. And we're going to solve the heat equation ut equal uxx on the finite interval from x is equal to zero up to x is equal to one. And we'll make use of boundary conditions that u of zero and t is equal to u of one and t is equal to zero for all t. And we'll make use of an exact solution that u of x of t is equal to e to the minus pi squared t times sine pi x. And we'll create an initial condition based on substituting t equals zero into this formula. And we're going to solve this equation over the time interval from t equals zero up to t equal 0.1. In our program, we'll define a function c underscore n that takes in a number of grid points to use and it will define two arrays A and B for representing our solution, and will then create a grid spacing DX and a time spacing DT. And in this case, because we're using the Crank-Nicholson method, we no longer have to satisfy any restriction on our time step choice, 
and we're therefore just using dx and dt to both scale linearly with the inverse of the number of grid points. We'll then define our constant mu that appears in our numerical update. We'll then set our initial condition that's based on plugging t equals zero into our exact formula. And to solve the Krang-Nicholson method, we have to deal with the implicit step. And to do this, we'll first create a linear system matrix for that implicit step. And we'll create this matrix A here, and it will have terms of one plus mu on the diagonal and minus a half mu on the upper and lower diagonals. We'll then modify the first row and last row of this matrix in order to impose our Dirichlet boundary conditions. We'll then go ahead and perform the time steps. And in the Crank-Nicholson method, we first perform part of the step that is explicit, and then we solve a linear system in order to get our complete update. And it's worth noting that the way that this code is written is not as efficient as it could be. We're just using the dense linear algebra solver in NumPy to solve this linear system. But in fact, our matrix A here is tridiagonal, and therefore this system could be solved much more efficiently than what's shown in this example. We'll now evaluate an L2 norm to our reference exact solution, and we'll return the value of this norm. Then we'll loop over a range of grid sizes. We'll start with using m equal four grid points, and we'll keep looping until m exceeds 512 grid points. We'll call our Crank-Nicholson function, and we'll report the number of grid points, the grid spacing, and that L2 error between our numerical solution and our exact solution. And we'll then double the number of grid points and repeat. So let me now go ahead and run this program. And by default, this program outputs its results to the terminal. But let me now save these results to a temporary file called out. And I'm now going to plot the results in GNU plot. So what I want to do here then is I want to plot the results that will now show us our, how our L2 error scales with the grid size. So I'm going to plot here my data file and I'll plot on the x-axis the grid spacing and on the y-axis that L2 error. And I'm going to make use of uh, log log scales. So we see here that the grid points form a straight line in the log log space, and that is indicative of polynomial convergence. And as we expect here, our errors should scale like the grid spacing h squared. So let me now plot a curve h squared on top of here, and we'll check that this is indeed second order convergence. And we can indeed see here that the scaling of our Crank-Nicholson errors is quadratic in H, as expected, demonstrating the second order accuracy of this method.